Welcome everyone. I'm Dorian. I'm the host of MedTech Trends. Today we have with us Michelle Laflamme. Michelle is an experienced and accomplished entrepreneur in the medical field. She has a master's degree in law and has spent the past 20 years bringing innovation to the market from bench to bedside. She started in Movi in 2008, which has developed NIKG, which is a personalized knee assessment device that generates actionable insights and insights regarding the joints movement while weight bearing. She has also created an accelerator for medical device companies in Quebec called CTS Health. She is a member of the board of a nonprofit organization set up by the city of Montreal to support entrepreneurs. And she is also a member of the Action Plan for Entrepreneurs of the Ministry of Education and Innovation in Quebec. In her spare time, she's a full-time hockey mom. Well, yeah, welcome, Michelle. Thank <laughs> well, thank you, Dorian. So I, I actually really wanted to start off by asking you about that because you certainly seem to be balancing a lot of different things. So obviously, uh, the the role of being a CEO of this um, of this healthcare start of uh, this healthcare company takes up a lot of time. But on top of that, uh, you're also uh, driving your your son around to hockey uh, games and everything. How do you manage to balance everything? I don't know. I think it's uh, <laughs> just a question of uh, letting things happen and uh, go with the flow. And, but uh, I think I'm passionate. I'm a passionate person and uh, I'm very, my company is, uh, is it comes from a dream and uh, the family else also. So it com combining the both is okay. Mm -hmm. did, you, um, did you always want to take on uh, the role of a, of a CEO? Was this always part of your, your goals when you were kind of growing up and going through school? When I was young, uh, very young, um, I, I remember at the elementary school, um, I wrote to the teacher that one day I will, be, I will have my own company. Um, then uh, at the, when you have to decide your career and uh, your plan in terms of school and so on, then I decided to go um, and study the law and become a lawyer. And I realized that uh, the law was a tool for me to accomplish my, my ultimate objective, to have my own company. And uh, ELF um, was a, a good, a good um, a very interesting field because uh, you, not only you, can able, you are able to bring, well, to, to create your company, but to um, ultimately help people. And uh, so this, this is how it, it happened. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you also mentioned that, uh, that your, your mother was uh, an entrepreneur, I believe. Is that, is that right? Yes. And it was quite important because uh, when you go to school, you go to universities, you have your law degree, your master degree. And then you said, you said to your parents and your family, okay, I, I stop everything and I'll start my own company. It could be a shock. Uh, but uh, my mother was an entrepreneur, so she was very happy and said, Michelle, go. I really encourage you to move forward and to, I, it's, uh, you will succeed. So uh, it was very helpful. That, that is a model as well. Mm -hmm. That's very encouraging, absolutely, to have um, uh, role models that are so close to you because you, you could go out and, and find uh, mentors in, in a lot of different places. And I think that's, it's become very easy to do that, to have role models and mentors, especially in the age of social media and well, pretty much everything internet related. But um, it's not always easy to find the right person to motivate you and that, that can really inspire you. So if there's someone that close to you that can do that, whose opinion you can really trust, I think that, that goes very far. That's, that's true because um, the person that are very close to you will tell you the, the exact truth. <laughs> that's something you don't want to hear, but you know, they are here. They are there to help. W were there any moments like that when you were thinking of creating a, a movie? Um, I would say, of course, yes. But uh, the most important uh, moment was in 2016. Uh, we know when you bring innovative devices, well, innovations to market, there is a, a very um, uh, uh, well-known, um, uh, uh, how can I say that, but problem that is called the value of death. So we faced, I faced the value of death in 2015, well, 16. And uh, it was, that moment was very crucial to have the help of your, you know, your, your parents to say, well, you face a very difficult moment, but you're going to make it. So, and we just, uh, I was able to make it. And now we are, we are uh, the, the objective for us is to attack the critical mass. So just uh, a little bit uh, further, the value of that, so which is uh, very, uh, 
very a very good feeling. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I can imagine absolutely. So, so you, you mentioned that. So this was an important event that happened in 2016, um, and between then and all the way going back to 2008, when when you were first starting this company, um, obviously a lot of different things have happened along the way. And so uh, we definitely wanted to dive into that a little bit. Um, and I'm glad you shared that about uh, having important role models, because I think that that's a big part of um, a- anybody trying to launch something like this. It's certainly a very difficult process to launch a company. And, and of course, like leading a company as a CEO is incredibly challenging. And there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, ups and downs that come with it. Um, and to do it successfully is uh, not something that everyone can do. So I can certainly appreciate that. Uh, um, that uh, having role models and uh, and just being very very adamant about doing good for people that that can actually help a lot with uh, the success of the company. So uh, I wanted to uh, ask you. Um, so in terms of uh, a movie, now a movie again has created this uh, this has developed this uh, product um, called uh, NikkeiG, and so one of the key things that it addresses is uh, people that have knee pain or knee uh, osteoarthritis, I believe. And so it, it, I did a quick um, uh, kind of search. And so what I was uh, looking to find is exactly how much of an impact this can have on people. Um, and uh, if we look at some simple epidemiological studies, uh, there, there are quite a few out there, but really I, I was surprised to learn that it affects a lot of people. Uh, among adults, there are studies that you know show as much as a quarter of adults, you know, 30% even more. Uh, and then if we're looking at more specialized populations like uh, athletes, uh, it, you know, it can be the risk of having knee pain or serious knee pain can be two or three times higher than, uh, than let's say, your, your average person. So he, clearly there's a huge demand for this kind of thing. Uh, I'm wondering, how, how did you decide to focus on this area? Well, I first, um, when I did my master's degree, um, it was to bring innovative devices to the market within the medical uh, field. And uh, I worked with, um, I was uh, lucky enough to work on different projects uh, with the American Red Cross uh, to uh, address the Chris Jacob disease, for example, to bring new filters uh, to the market. And in 2005, I decided to to work with companies to um, to try to identify a technology that I would I will try to push myself and bring to the market, rather than working uh, with companies. And um, I was uh, involved in uh, an assessment of this technology, the NIKG. Uh, I was invited to comment on the potential, the commercial potential of that technology by the uh, the two main, uh, teaching os- well the the one teaching hospital that was involved in the development, and the two universities. And they asked me to, uh, to come up with uh, the best way to move forward with the technology. So I just realized that uh, it was, uh, I was amazed by the, the, um, the number of studies that they have done to validate this, this technology. So first, in terms of uh, work, that was done you know, perfectly. Uh, sometimes uh, researchers forget that they, to, to go through that uh, very, um, uh, uh, that moment, well, that that step that needs that you need to go through to demonstrate the, the accuracy, reliability, reproducibility, and to publish, you need to to publish to 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 have some peer reviewed papers, and they have done a very good work on that. So I was amazed by the the quality of the work first, and then it was a, a tool to assess the knee in movement, but they didn't know what was the um, how to use the data that uh, the, the, these signals uh, from this, this technology. So just to explain to you, the NIKG, it's like the electrocardiogram for the heart, but for the knee. It measures the knee function. It gives a tracing of the, your knee movement uh, in the triangles of movement of, of your knee, and it measures with, it measures, uh, with very, very high accuracy uh, the movement of your bones. And um, those signals, those tracings, uh, what we have decided to do is to correlate them to clinical information, what it means for a doctor. And it, we were impressed because there was a direct correlation to knee pain and to different symptoms in the patients. And that makes sense because when you have a knee pain, the pain occurs in the movement. It's when you bend your knee, it's when you golf, that you will uh, go through your symptoms and uh, nobody can see inside the knee what's going on. Now that the X-ray and the MRI are static and they do not have that correlation to pain. So the doctors 
what they do is okay we're going to try this we're going to try that we're going to do this we'll see uh, so it's very long and painful for, for patients to try to understand and uh, you know try to to have a better understanding of their problems so this is how it happens um, it's really first finding this uh, very uh, wonderful researchers team and uh, secondly to to work with doctors on what it means in terms of signals and then to use artificial, artificial intelligence to correlate uh, this uh, these data to these uh, these clinical meanings and to develop the Nikki jet it is right now so now it's a tool that is available to doctors uh, to help them to assess the knee uh, to have a better understanding of the pain the cause of the pain and to address uh, these uh, mechanical deficits mm -hmm. so uh, if I understood correctly so the original like while you were looking at all the um, uh, evidence that was generated in all the publications related to this technology um, the original like NIKG instrument that was developed for research purposes or was that um, was, was that intentionally designed for clinical application it was uh, designed uh, to understand the um, um, what's uh, the impact of a ligament and the ligament reconstruction in the knee to okay. understand what as a surgeon uh, what type of uh, reconstruction they should do in the knee and now they they try to well I don't I don't want to 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 use the the world the word guess but they it's a it's an art you as a surgeon for uh, a knee surgeon is a lot of uh, everything is based on experience and art so it was the purpose the, behind the NIKG technology was to give them a better tool to research the best technique for surgery but it turns out that uh, it explained the pain the symptoms and in fact the literature that exists right now uh, uh, acknowledged the, the the correlation between the movement and you know the, those mechanical deficit and knee osteoarthritis is a mechan is a mechanical uh, disease so if as a patient you have knee OA um, then you can uh, address those mechanical deficits right? so it's a wear and tear disease and it's caused by the stress on your knee and this is why a lot of athletes suffer from uh, uh, osteoarthritis in the knee and this is why active people also uh, suffer from that and this is why some obese person also suffer from that because it all relates to the alignment of your lower limb the way the the bones relate together and cause some causes some some stress and uh, some pain and um, the impact on the cartilage this is what can be measured and, and uh, addressed mm -hmm. so in terms of actually uh, so using knee kg um, let's say if, if I'm as a patient I'm going into a clinic so I would be I would be coming in for knee pain. Let's say I'm not sure exactly what it is. Um, I can do an assessment using this device. Uh, it would record this uh, information, process it uh, using um, intelligent analytics, and then at that point it provides a certain output. And that output could be um, it could help to diagnose something like knee arthritis or knee pain or something uh, let's say more severe than that. And is that a similar process? Is that what would happen? Yes, in fact, for a doctor to diagnose knee osteoarthritis is, is pretty easy. The problem is what you do, what, what can be done with the patient. Now they only manage the pain because they don't know what, what to do. What can be done to stop the progression of the disease? And because it's a mechanical disease, then the real impact and the real value proposition of the NIKG is to bring that information. These are the cause of the OA progression. And this is what you can do to address those mechanical deficits. And uh, we have um, uh, the, um, uh, in Quebec, a, a, a huge clinical study, and in fact, the biggest one in Canada on the knee osteoarthritis was done uh, with uh, the support of the um, Ministry of uh, Economy and Innovation and the Ministry of, uh, of Health to document the impact of using the NICAGE system in, with uh, knee osteoarthritis patients and to um, and to compare the results, if you use that information, those results to uh, tailor, the, personalize the treatment plan compared to what you do now as a, to a normal patient, then the results were significantly uh, Im impressive in terms of patients uh, uh, got their, well, reduced their pain, increased their function, uh, improved their quality of life, their, ad their adherence to the treatment plan, so uh, the, the impact was, was very uh, meaningful. Mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. and, and again, like all, all of this is because uh, the device itself actually lets, let's say me as a physician give, um, it, it gives me better information, better diagnostic information, uh, which I can then use to actually do the diagnosis and create a treatment plan that's really tailored to individual patients. It's really the, the information exactly. part is, is more rich than you would get if you were just doing an x-ray or, or an MRI. Yeah, exactly. It's like, for example, the, the heart, a doctor could say, okay, you have a, a, a problem with the rhythm of your, of your, of your heart, but so the electrocardiogram will give further, in, well, additional insight about the exact problematic and cause so that the doctor can better understand and figure out what needs to be done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm wondering also, this, this is obviously, this was developed alongside a, a team of clinicians. And, uh, and I'm wondering how that process went. Um, did, did you have to uh, get a specialist on, on board that could help with um, not only the, the technology part of it, but also let's say like the, the visualization of the information that's collected by the device? How yeah, was that exactly. feedback? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. We worked with a, a clinical advisory board uh, and uh, the, uh, we had some, uh, we were very lucky. We, we worked with uh, very, knowledgeable person uh, in in our field uh, talk leaders and uh, they gave us some some time because at the beginning as a startup you don't have money uh, so uh, they just helped me and helped me to to better understand those uh, those signals and what it means and to correlate them to do some trials uh, um, to make sure that uh, we document properly we are able to publish and we now have more than 100 peer reviewed papers on the technology uh, in terms of uh, so it's uh, it's it's all peer reviewed so uh, it's it's a for me it's it's a wow it was very very helpful to have those clinical advisors and I can name some of them uh, so we work with uh, with Dr Ranger in Quebec uh, Dr Guillaume Dr David Bayargent Dr Laving um, in the United States uh, we were lucky enough to work with Dr Hunter one of the top five in neo osteoarthritis uh, with Dr Stanton Dr Koval uh, so. Very uh, Dr. Nere in France, so we were very, very happy, lucky to to have the privilege to work with these uh, very knowledgeable peer person. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's wonderful that you mentioned uh, all those individuals. Um, it's it's often not easy for, from from what I um, know to get that many people, especially the highly esteemed people, to come on board and to to collaborate. Uh, but it certainly sounds very impressive. Um, and I'll come back to the idea of uh, building a team uh, or an advisory board to actually help with this kind of venture, because obviously none of this is possible as, as an individual. It always takes a, a team effort to put all of this together. Absolutely. So we'll definitely come back to that topic. Um, since you mentioned uh, the clinical study, and um, I, I'm wondering, you know, one of the, the topics uh, nowadays that, I mean, it's been relevant for a while, but it's certainly... Uh, on on the top of a lot of people's sort of priorities is is how to get uh, a big how to get people engaged to participate in a clinical study. Uh, the the recruitment process is always something that is a that can be a barrier, can be a challenge, and it's not just because um, you you often need to hit a certain number of, of patients to be able to make it um, to to get your to make the results uh, clinically um, and statistically relevant. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, there, there are other circumstances for patients. They, they may or may not want to participate. So I'm wondering if you came across, like, what was your strategy for recruiting patients? Were there any, were there any challenges or barriers to actually getting people to come on board for your studies? What we have done, uh, in fact, uh, the, the clinical study that the latest we have done on uh, about 1,000 patients with the Quebec uh, government, what we have done is, uh, well, the researchers, what they have done is uh, they uh, recruited um, family practices and the doctors of these family practices, they recruited uh, 300 of these uh, group practice and they, the doctors in these group practice uh, have to uh, recruit two or three patients. Mm -hmm. So that was the way to overcome that challenge. Otherwise, I agree with you, it, it can be a real challenge. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, I, I know that there are a lot of uh, services dedicated to just uh, helping um, companies or, or agencies actually recruit patients. Um, it's, uh, it's certainly a relevant topic, especially in this uh, age where everything has to be evidence-based. And so a lot of decision-making or more and more decision-making is happening around, you know, what is, what is the evidence to support um, this decision to uh, 
to adopt a certain technology or a certain medication. Um, and then, you know, in other words, what is, what is the value and the values demonstrated by this evidence? But the evidence is often very lengthy and very expensive to do. And of course, there's mm -hmm. a practical limitations of actually enrolling patients to begin with. So um, glad to hear that you were able to overcome that with a, with a certain strategy. Yes, something that helped us is the fact that the, the, the clinical study was not led by a company. It was mm -hmm. led by a teaching hospital for the, well, with the support of the Quebec government. So that I think makes a good, a big difference. And it's, uh, the results are even better for us. It's more mm -hmm. credible. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, you also mentioned that the device has reimbursement both in Canada and the U.S., if I understood that correctly. We do have some uh, some reimbursement, uh, for example, in the U.S. Uh, we, uh, some customers report reimbursement, uh, but we do have to come up, of course, with uh, budget impact assessment, prepare. This is what we are doing now. Uh, but so far, so good. We use CPT codes that exist, but we need to, to continue to document the clinical benefits and the economical benefits. So this is what we, this is one of the main uh, priority um, uh, we just closed the financing of $20 million and one of the priority is really to document and make sure that so we are bulletproof in terms of uh, economical data per mm -hmm. payer. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it, it, oh, sorry, I think you were going to say something. Yeah. And in Canada, we have started uh, with, uh, with uh, the Quebec province. Um, we are in discussion uh, for now to, to reimburse the tests. And uh, the objective is to, of course, to get the reimbursement, the Medicare coverage uh, from coast to coast. Uh, and Halifax, uh, we have some, uh, some very good, uh, good, good news. They, we work with the Nova Scotia Health Authority over there, and uh, they have the NICAG system, and they open to uh, scale up. So uh, very good, mm -hmm. uh, good news for us. Mm -hmm. For and sure. For patients living with, uh, with knee pain. Especially for patients. And we are going into a, 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 a demographic where there, there's, there are more um, older adults. And so it's becoming more and more relevant um, as, as certainly as the, there's a demographic shift uh, happening right now. And I'm also wondering, um, are there any uh, restrictions on the, the reimbursement criteria that you have right now? Are you going for a certain uh, patient demographic or would this be, let's say, available to anybody? Um, the uh, RCD10 uh, applicable to the to the NICG, for example, in the United States, it covers uh, all type of knee pain uh, from knee osteoarthritis, ligament injuries, meniscus tear, tears, um, uh, also, also uh, residual pain post up. Um, so it covers a lot of uh, most of the main uh, problems of the knee. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm. I'll just mention my age, <laughs> but I'm. Uh, so I'm 30, and then. Every so if if I wanted to go into a clinic, let's say this was uh, purely voluntary, uh, but if I wanted to get my own assessment, then can I go to the clinic and just do it pretty much on my own and and uh, get get it uh, covered that way, or would I have to get like a prescription? Do I have to go through my primary care doctor, which which is obviously you know they're the gatekeeper to a lot of um, getting a lot of additional uh, testing done. But would that be the process I can go myself, or would I need a prescription for that, or not a prescription Canada, but a referral? In Canada. In Canada. In Canada, well, in, you don't need a prescription because we are still in the private market. So some clinics offer the NICAG system. We have some, some clinics uh, that will open in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Vancouver. Uh, we have some in discussion in Ontario. We have existing clinics offering the, the system and the, the, the test in Quebec. We have some also in, uh, in, Alif in uh, Nova Scotia. So, but in, except for Nova Scotia, you don't need a prescription. In the United States, it depends on your coverage, so it depends on the, the on the on the payers. So, um, and and it's it's a slightly different system over there, to yeah. put it lightly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, so okay, so this is good. So it's going to be accessible to a wide variety of, of patients, and certainly a lot of people can can benefit from using this technology. And uh, I'm wondering also now kind of uh, zooming out a little bit, um, just going back, let's say since 2008, since the, the company um, was started, uh, what, what are some of the key milestones do you feel? Some of the, some of the moments that you felt like, okay, this is awesome. That one of the things that you mentioned was the uh, securing of the, the uh, 20 million in, in funding. Were there any other major milestones that really drove the company toward its, uh, the success that it's experiencing now? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, one of the um, the key driver was the uh, the acceptance, the adoption of our technology by Penn Medicine in Lancaster in, in the United States. It's a health network that is, is a huge health network. And what they have decided to do is uh, to, uh, to, to uh, focus on innovative devices to, to reduce their cost. Um, and uh, because a lot of companies go and knock to the doors of hospitals saying, oh, we, we have a new technology we would like to you to assess it and so on. So they, they, they with Capital Blue Cross, they teamed up and uh, with Aspire Ventures, so three partners, four par par partners, in fact, um, they team up and decided to um, um, call for, or send some, a call for proposition to companies so we could apply and, and uh, well, propose our technology. And we were selected uh, among, uh, uh, I think, 100 uh, participants. And so two companies were selected. So we were very, very lucky. And uh, so we went through their certification process. Uh, it's a process where they assess uh, if your technology, well, the technology has to respond to a need, an important need, an important need that will make a difference in terms of, of, of uh, health impact. Uh, you need to demonstrate that you can reduce cost. Uh, so all of the credible aims, you need to address them and demo demonstrate that you have uh, proven that and then you go through the process of uh, certification can you connect to the emr can can you do this can you do that and so on and uh, are you easily scalable and uh, so we were certified so i was very very uh, enthused about that and uh, it was a, a huge step for us um, so it means that we can expand we can scale up uh, we we learned a lot from that process. These people were am amazing. They uh, you talked about mentors. They were not officially mentors, but they act as a mentor because they were very helpful in, in helping us to understand uh, the potential barriers, objections, uh, the improvement required, and so on. And they they were um, we were in they were in a solution mode. Uh, so it was a very easy process in that in that regards. And uh, we were certified, uh, and uh, we are now doing the pilots with them, uh, with the objective to be able to expand uh, across their health network, which is amazing. And that's something that happened to us. Second thing is the clinical study uh, with uh, the SHUM and um, uh, with the supported by the Quebec government. Uh, that's a huge endorsement, and it's a it, the results are fantastic, not only in terms of, we are happy with the results, of course, but they, they come from an institution, you know, a health institution. So, and, um, so, and it, was, uh, it was a very difficult process. You cannot, we were approved among uh, many others, and uh, so it was uh, uh, quite a challenge, and uh, so that's another key driver, and those two, led to the financing that we, we closed 20 million dollars because of the results because of the market demand because of the of the traction in the in the field these two items open doors for us so um yeah i would say that and it sounds yeah both huge opportunities and and uh those are uh, projects that are going to continue into the future it'll will it take do you have um so you mentioned the pilot will that take a, a few years to uh to expand those operations the objective is uh, to, um, of course, to expand across their, their, their network and, and um, Capital Blue Cross is part of the, this collaboration. So Capital Blue Cross covers uh, uh, 21 uh, counties mm -hmm. in, the, um, in the United States and they are part of the Blues and the Blues cover one American out of three. So it's, it's like we have a lot of potential just because of that. That's a huge reach. I'm wondering too, uh, in, just in terms of patient uh, numbers, how many through the studies that um, that have been completed so far, and even the ones that are that are ongoing, how many patients would you say? I wonder if you can put a number to it that have actually used the the device, the EKG device, and how many have actually been uh, impacted by it. I, well, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm curious. In terms of number of uses, it's uh, over 10,000. Mm -hmm. We don't can't count them anymore, but it's, uh, it's above that. And um, because the last time we, we calculated, it was about that. So, yeah. And uh, in terms of impact, um, it's, uh, it's very, um, uh, I would say that we receive a lot of testimonials from patients other than clinical studies. Of course, in the clinical study with uh, the teaching hospital that we just mentioned, 
um, they uh, we we demonstrated that um, they uh, the patients were highly satisfied with the results. Uh, I, the re the results was eight to four percent of of satisfaction compared to uh, the the latest uh, study in that in this regards was in two thousand eleven. Uh, the satisfaction of patients uh, uh, that face a neosteritis and their knee was uh, 43 percent. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's close to the double. So people are satisfied. But in the field, you receive uh, we receive a lot of testimonials. People are as uh, for example, uh, um, we uh, we worked with uh, an athlete, a gold a medalist to the Olympic, uh, Bruno Surin. Um, he had some some very good results in his knees. He, he had he felt that his knee that he was he is still young, but he, he felt uh, old because his, his his knees were very affected by OA, and uh, we helped them to address the, the those mechanical deficits that uh, were uh, linked to the OA progression in his, his in his knees, and he doesn't need uh, uh, pain medication and uh, 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 anymore. So that's. A very interesting testimonial. Uh, another one I, I met with uh, a guy saying I, I couldn't step in my car nor, nor step out of my car. Now I can. So, and I we also bring back. Uh, we were able to bring back people to the jogging, uh, other, but these people were told by their doctor that they could not jog anymore. Uh, so that's pretty very very interesting uh, comments, and uh, I'm always pleased to hear some of them. Absolutely. I can certainly appreciate that. And um, I had a chance to look at uh, your website and I know that there are a few testimonials there. And so one of the things that I noticed is that, you know, this is, this is something where you can do, you can do a lot of different studies. And of course, it's extremely important to capture the, the objective impact of these um, of the technology and what it actually means for patients. But I think at the end of the day, um, there it's hard to really understand the full impact of, of what something like this will mean on a patient until you just have a chance to hear it from somebody like, like Bruni or, or other patients, because it's a, it, this, you know, knee pain, especially when it's severe is something that really affects, affects you in, in all aspects of, of your life. Right. There are, yeah. there are other circumstances outside of just your, um, let's say your normal kind of day-to-day -day objective type of functioning. Um, it can affect your, you know, work productivity can affect uh, the way that you sleep at night and so on and so forth. So hearing it from patients and hearing positive feedback from them, I think is a real testament to the benefits of it. And it's not something that you capture in a single number. It's, you have to hear it from them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and one of the other uh, things that uh, you mentioned about this technology is that it's not just unique to, to knee pain, but in fact, it can be applied to uh, a lot of other uh, joint related problems. I wonder if you can speak to that a little bit. Yes, of course. Uh, with uh, our, when we succeed in uh, with uh, ma making sure that we expand this technology, uh, what we have uh, uh, in the radar is to apply to the shoulder and to the hip and to the ankle. So we have started, um, and the objective will be to to bring one of these three to the market as well. Something that we are doing now is because the the results are now used. Uh, in conservative care to better determine what can, what can be done in a patient suffering from knee pain and post-op for residual pain. But the objective is to bring this information to the surgeon. How can the, 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 sur well, the technique used can be affected, improved using the function of the knee? Because ultimately what they want to do is to restore the function. Now they operate the image. So we can bring this in information. So also there we have started to work with surgeons and uh, we, have, we are able to, the system is sensitive enough to compare a surgery, a, a type of surgery compared to another technique, uh, an implant compared to another implant. Uh, so uh, the objective is to help to better determine what type of implant could be useful, could be the best for the person, uh, the function that needs to be restored. So this is where uh, also another area of, uh, of interest to us and that we have started to work on. Mm -hmm. It sounds like this is going to be something that will also, it, it will open up the doors to a lot of other research um, opportunities 
so, so beyond just clinical care, but the, the, the opportunity to actually do more precise research. So from a researcher's perspective or a physician's perspective, you would want to know, um, you would want to know information that's a lot more detailed and directly from the patient and, um, is a more sort of layered than, than like you mentioned, um, static images from an x-ray or an MRI. So I, I see there's a lot of potential in, uh, in the research applications and that even opens up even more doors. Yeah, absolutely. But now what we, we intend to do is to really focus on the uh, conservative care, but also working with, uh, with, with athletes and sports teams to um, prevent injuries. Because now that you know uh, the mechanical deficit of, of the knee, you can uh, improve the, the training of the athletes to avoid a potential injury, to improve the performance of the knee. For example, football players, uh, hockey players, uh, basketball players. Uh, so they 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 do use a, a lot of well, they do, they do put a lot of pressure on their knee, and um, it's they are highly um, uh, solicited. So uh, we can help them to make sure that the the performance of their knee is at the the highest level. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to get a sense of ju just how big this device is, but because if we're talking about athletes, I'm also envisioning, you know, almost like a wearable technology so you can wear it during practice and then you can see where the pain points are based on your movements. Is this, is this a portable device or is it like, like an MRI sized machine? It's uh, the equivalent to the electrocardiogram. So the test is done on, on the treadmill uh, and the size of the system is a bit like the echograph mm -hmm. aside, uh, the, the, uh, the treadmill. And uh, it's uh, not portable because those portable technologies exist. But the problem is that, it, that they, are, they cannot be used to diagnose the cause of the pain. It's a wellness, these are wellness uh, um, system to score and to, to, to improve movement, but it's more well-being. It's not uh, uh, medical grade. Mm -hmm. so, to bring that technology to the portable level, the technology needs to be improved. The technology that exists right now is not yet portable, but we are working on it. Try mm -hmm. to do something around it. That's a, an interesting point you bring up. Um, uh, you're right. There are a lot of um, like wearables are becoming um, almost fashionable. It's not just right. something that's useful or trendy or something. It's it actually it's it's just fashionable to wear them. Um, but this is there's a distinction here between something that's available to the consumer and something that's available to practitioners who actually use it in a professional setting. Um, and I wonder if there's a, if you can comment on that a little bit. This is not this is not just a, a simple device. This is something that's that's medical grade. Yeah, exactly. So we are FDA approved uh, as a class two device. Um, it's a system that uh, our customers are clinics, hospitals rehab centers. Um, so we work with the three of them. Uh, and uh, we and this, this, the NICAG system is, uh, is installed uh, for free. There is no cost for the clinic or nor the hospital. And there's, the business model is, is a fee per use. Um, so it's uh, reduced the risk for the customer. And uh, it's, uh, the objective is to remove any and all barriers to, to make sure that we can expand. But so the customer is really, the, the, we work with the clinicians. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I'm getting a better sense now. Uh, let's go back to uh, the topic of building a unique team. Now, the, the company was around uh, since 2008. Um, how have you gone through this process of selecting people to work with? Oh my God, there is a question <laughs> of talent and there is a question of timing. At the beginning, I think you, get, you can get confused because you meet a lot of talent but the timing is not right. So I made the mistake of hiring talent, but not at the right time. Uh, so then you learn, and it's a learning process. And uh, I, I think we, are, we now have a, the, the, the perfect dream team. Uh, we have uh, 50, 50, 15 employees and, uh, in the US and Canada, and a uh, very knowledgeable person, but uh, I, I realized that the values are important. So the values of Imovi is to really make sure that we are people that are who are passionate about what they do, uh, and they are willing to to make a difference in the lives of, of of people. It's not only a job, you know. They their passion makes a big difference, and the pleasure to work 
uh, the pleasure to work with this new technology, the pleasure to work with doctors, the pleasure to work with patients, the pleasure to work all together. So those two things were very, very important. And, uh, you know, when I met people, not only I was uh, looking for talent, but I was looking for those two values. Um, and uh, all of the team uh, meet uh, these two criteria, and it makes a big difference. I can I can uh, imagine. I'm sure it makes a big big difference. Not only working with your with your head, but also with your heart, right? And just knowing that it yeah. actually has an impact on on somebody's life at the end of the road. Yeah, absolutely. Is there something uh, you would say that makes your team different or unique now, as opposed to the let's say the the original group um, of people back in 2008? What, what's unique about the team now? Um. How can I say that? Well, of course, we are, the, the team is bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a big family. Um, but um, I would say that uh, it's not them that changed, it's me. Because mm -hmm. my, my understanding of what you need to build a company changed. So at that time, I was very satisfied with the team. But uh, I, I now know that the team I have uh, corresponds to what we need to succeed. I would mm -hmm. say that. That's an interesting one. Okay, that's actually that's a very nice twist. It's uh, it's about your personal growth, and uh, and that also led to changes uh, within the team. Um, and certainly judging by how uh, successful the company has actually become, um, it's positive change. Yeah. I can appreciate that as well. Um, okay, uh, let's also go back to the some of the other work that you do outside of um well both your uh role as a ceo and uh as as a hockey mom um you're you've also started uh an accelerator and you serve on a number of committees um just uh just generally i'm wondering you know how do you feel it's important or why is it important to support others on their entrepreneurial goals i was uh, very lucky and privileged to be um supported i think it's um it's natural for me to to give back and if i can give back help and make a difference in the lives of an entrepreneur i just i'm very very happy with that so it's important for me also to because a lot of um uh you acquire a lot of knowledge and if i would have known certain things a few years ago maybe i would have avoided to do certain mistakes but nobody was there to tell me. Now I say, okay, I've done some mistakes. I should share. I should share, you know, the lessons learned from that and to maybe uh, also uh, with my network to open doors for people who need it. So uh, for me, it's uh, to support entrepreneurs. Of course, I have knowledge and my network is mostly in the, within the health network. So I, I, I tend to give most of my time to committees and boards uh, within my uh, within the health uh, area, but I'm also involved in, uh, in the entrepreneurship in Quebec uh, to make sure that so we give, you know, another challenge is when you start your company, no matter uh, your field of expertise, um, where do you go? How do you start? Uh, when is the best timing to look for money? Uh, who are the person who can help you with that? Uh, you face many questions and, uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, very challenging, and uh, you don't know. You really don't know. You need to to uh, to search the information, to test the information. To uh, so, I would like to 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 help in facilitating that uh, that work for entrepreneurs. And I think in Quebec, uh, the organizations here are doing a very good job because they I'm involved in in um, in, in uh, at the uh, the table d'entrepreneuriat. Uh, the objective is to, 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 to develop some tools to help entrepreneurs. First, educate um, young people to the possibility to become an entrepreneur. It's, it's, a possibility, it's an option. You can become a dentist, you can become a, you know, a, a lawyer, a lawyer, a mailman, whatever, but you can become an entrepreneur. Um, and, uh, and there are uh, now some, uh, some very interesting uh, courses uh, in uh, at the, not only at the, at the universities but also at the college uh, high schools and even at the elementary school now they try to, to implement this so I'm very very uh, proud to be part of that initiative and uh, we continue now with um, 
uh, with mapping the road of the entrepreneur. So what is the, the different, uh, what is, well, the ultimate mapping and where uh, certain organization and uh, key things uh, will be the best for you? Try to, 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 to accelerate also that, uh, that phase. Uh, so that's a part of my involvement. And the, another thing is also within the health area, of course, in, uh, in Canada, we have a public health system. And the challenge for a medical device company is it's not like a, a drug. A drug, once you have done your clinical studies and that you have demonstrated the, the of course, the safety, but after that, the, the clinical effectiveness uh, and the uh, cost effectiveness, then it's a question of, uh, of marketing and you, you hit the market. A medical device, the problem is that uh, the impact is on the episode of care. So you change the continuum of care of the patient, the doctors, the hospitals, the clinics, so the impact um, is a challenge. Well, it's a challenge because the impact is not only for, you know, you don't only add a drug to the list of things that can be prescribed to a patient, but you need to have a dedicated room, a dedicated technician. You need to change the formulary, the form at the beginning for that test. Uh, or if, um, So it's complicated for medical medical devices companies because they you could face you could uh, have a need you could have traction but the logistic behind adopting medical dev innovative devices um, is is difficult um, so if you go for example if you go into the United States to deploy your system you can knock to the door of, of an hospital they will say oh yes it's interesting but for us you would need to demonstrate this so come and uh, we'll work together, we'll see, we'll how does this to demonstrate this impact or this impact. Another hospital could say, no, this is not the way we would like to see it. We would like to see it that way. So it's, uh, it's a very, um, it's pioneering. Because of our public health system in Canada, uh, per province, so per province, you could use your, med your medical system to help companies to create adoption. Imagine if we are able to use our, our health system here in Canada to say, okay, we invite companies, a bit like the, 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 the privilege we had in, uh, with Penn Medicine in Lancaster, say, okay, we invite companies to come up, we're gonna assess your technology, and if you meet those criteria and uh, those things that we need here in our province, uh, then you have a market. We're gonna have some, uh, some tenders uh, to adopt the uh, uh, technology. Um, and then you can use the, the data generated, economic and clinical, to go elsewhere in other health network and use this to expand. Um, I think we have the privilege in Canada because of there is uh, that unique particularity of the public health system to be able to offer that to, to, to companies and to uh, attract companies to come here, invest here. And uh, like Imovi, my company, um, because of that success, well, we were able to close the financing to, to support our growth. So if we are offered that, we will, we will enter us and attract new companies and investors who will support those companies. So this is where, this is another project I have with uh, some uh, organizations in Quebec who are working on making this happen. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something very interesting, this distinction between medical devices and medicines. Um, I'm more familiar with the uh, with the medicines um, than I'm with the medical uh, devices, but um, the but the, there is a very clear distinction between the two. And I'm wondering, do you see uh, NKG as having an impact on um, on the let's say the the practice guidelines in terms of how things like knee osteoarthritis um, or knee pain are actually um, not just diagnose and treat it, but really in terms of more, a broader kind of clinical workflow around how those are um, dealt with in a clinical setting? Yes, of course. Um, but it's already in the guideline because the guidelines for doctors, what they say is that as a doctor, when you face a patient having a knee pain, you need to uh, assess the alignment. You need to assess the, well, when the, the uh, during the gait, you need to try to visualize what is the alignment. But doctors, they are unable to do it. And when you do it, you can have 10 doctors who will come up with 10 different uh, type of measure, 
identification of uh, alignment. So it's, uh, it, it's difficult. So the guidelines, they say you need to assess the mechanical alignment because the, 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 the alignment is, a predict, is predictive of OA progression and, and of, of course uh, it explains different symptoms. Uh, so the next step for us will be to say, you, can, you have to measure the alignment and the best way to do it is with a validated measurement tool, such as an EKG. Of course, such as an EKG probably won't never be in the guidelines, but with a validated tool, because this is what we need now. Uh, we cannot continue to measure, um, to try to guess what's going on in the knee based on our eye only. Mm -hmm. That same issue, I think, is um, it comes up in virtually every single branch of medicine. I think it's, it's this idea of trying to really standardize care, um, but at the same time, you want to be able to tailor it to individual needs. And so there's almost like a tug of war between, okay, let's, let's have a, a tool that is very good and can give us very accurate and detailed information for us as clinicians to make um, a detailed uh, diagnoses and very accurate diagnoses, but at the same time, going one step further and saying, okay, here's this individual patient. How do we tailor this, you know, these guidelines, which are really, um, it, that's exactly what they are. They're guidelines at best. Um, how do we tailor that to individual patients? How, how um, can EKG sort of fit between those two uh, endpoints? The standard of care can sometimes be more costly than a personalized care. And the NICIG is a perfect example because the standard of care now is when a patients come with an, a knee pain, they say, okay, X-ray. And then uh, this is what the, that, this is not the standard, but this is the, what every doctor is do. They first start with the X-ray and then we say, okay, we're going to try to do some exercises. Let's try the physical therapy, to see a physical therapist. Uh, we can try a brace um, and uh, we'll see, uh, come up, come to a next to your next visit or second visit if it doesn't if it's not solved the the the, the fact the, the issue is that the patients come back to the second visit say well that helped a bit but uh it's i would say it's a 50 50 because in the literature it's uh, all of this these work but it's 50 50 and nobody knows why so they say okay we're going to do some uh we're going to do an injection. Uh, we're going to do uh, something. Uh, we're going to do this instead. And uh, I'm going to refer you to the MRI to see a, a, an orthopod. And then if it's not, if the patient is not a surgical candidate, we will be back to square one. So the cost of the episode of care is, is very high. It's, it's anything between $1,000 and $4,000. Um, so then EKG, we are able to demonstrate that with, it's only $200 the test so it's cheaper than the mi and you say okay this is the problem and this is what you need to do that's it that, <laughs> so, it sounds very simple I, I i like it um i and i can uh, i can completely understand the how this can actually come into a cost saving um uh conversation um personalized care i, I mean there, there are a lot of different ways to actually there's an entire section of, uh, of literature that really is uh, trying to make the argument of, and, and this is kind of speaking across the board, but really trying to make the argument that, um, you know, you can, if you have a personalized treatment approach, what that ends up doing is that it actually prevents or avoids a patient from getting unnecessary care. And sometimes that unnecessary care means that they have to go back to square one and try additional tests, or maybe their tests are duplicated in a different clinic, or, um, or, or they're just getting things that ultimately become harmful to them as patients. Um, and, uh, and so there are then, you know, downstream mitigating procedures that have to be implemented. So, so certainly, you know, having upfront, very clear, precise information about a diagnosis and being able to follow up on that, um, can present huge cost savings for, for certain patients, certainly. It's a very interesting point, I like that. Uh, so uh, Michelle, a uh, final question I wanted to ask you, who do you look up to? Who are your role models right now after everything uh, that you've uh, accomplished so far? I think uh, any and all entrepreneurs, um, even those who start are a good example to me because they, um, uh, they are refreshing. They, you know, in, you as an entrepreneur, the company, uh, 
you a, you have a point where it's it's no longer a startup and it's not yet a big company, but in between you you start managing people rather than uh, being actively involved in the field. But uh, they remember me that never forget you no know, what's happened in the field because your customers and in the field people will give you the exact truth about what you need to consider to make your company bigger. So they are very inspiring also by the courage they have to start their company and to, to, to do something like that. Also, uh, also, I'm very inspired by athletes. Um, in a certain way, there is a parallel you can do between athletes and entrepreneurs because they start with nothing. The only thing they, they have is the belief in themselves with a coach and no money. Uh, they have to do miracles and uh, they, they believe in, in the ultimate objective that uh, people around say, oh, cool. But, you know, you don't really get help until you succeed. Um, so entrepreneurs, they, you, they, a lot of, well, entrepreneurs face the same challenge and at least you need to, um, you face a lot of uh, sacrifice and you, you, your life is a bit different than others because the, uh, because of its requires to, to build uh, a company. So there is a lot of parallel with, uh, with athletes and I'm very inspired by, by, by them. Um, they're, you know, what they have invested in terms of time and effort to get there. Um, and, um, and even if they, they, they have, uh, uh, if they, they did not go to the Olympic, for example, but the, the work they have done is, is just wonderful. And um, I was listening to the, an interview with Georges St. Pierre about a month ago, and I'm not at all, uh, um, I don't mix martial arts. I don't <laughs> watch most fight uh, combat and so on, but uh, I was impressed by uh, things he was saying, the things that he, have, he has learned uh, throughout his process about, you know, uh, the, the challenges of performing, not performing, uh, the challenges of um, the competition, uh, the, the preparation to it, and so on. And uh, it was, uh, this is where I realized that the parallel between entrepreneurs and athletes. Mm -hmm. it, it's this combination of, and, and I like the way that you put it as well, in terms of it comes with a lot of uh, personal sacrifice and oftentimes being misunderstood by other people when you're just, you know, you're in the zone and you're doing your work that, uh, you know, while other people are, you know, let's say uh, going off and, and maybe working on their hobbies. Um, obviously hard work is uh, something that's in common to both athletes and uh, to, to entrepreneurs and, and dedication, perseverance. I mean, it, it's the list of all the, the uh, it's like the secret sauce that's required to, uh, to succeed yeah. in both. Yeah, because they, you, something that an entrepreneur has to explore a lot and, uh, and believe in, in this capacity is the intuition. Um, I would say even uh, feelings because, at, for example, my company, if I would have waited the data, the market to tell me that there was a need and this is the way I, I would bring this technology to the market, I would have never started. Hmm. Because... Um, it depends on your in uh, of your product, but for, uh, for us, the Nikiji is a uh, is a breakthrough innovation. So there was no need, there was no uh, demand, uh, there was no market to assess. So it's a bit like the athlete, you know, start something and say, okay, cool, but uh, are you sure you're gonna survive? <laughs> and say, yeah, I'll survive. <laughs> but uh, you have to to believe in your in your gut feeling, and um, so. Uh, and I invite entrepreneurs to believe in it because uh, it, uh, it takes time, but it pays. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it pays uh, not only for you, but uh, clearly there are a number of patients, many thousands of patients who uh, have used this and benefited from this uh, technology. And, and I'm sure there are many, many more thousand in the future who will also benefit from this uh, greatly. So uh, it's, and it's important because this is the reason why I'm doing it because uh, I was, uh, I was, I was, um, I was doing a lot of sports uh, younger and I, I suffered a lot from, uh, from knee pain and I couldn't believe that, you know, you, there is nothing, you have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. So if I can help people suffering from knee pain, that will be, um, my dream will be accomplished. Mm -hmm. It's so, uh, wonderful to hear that. So Michelle, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. And uh, what I would say is I, I wish you ongoing success 
and I hope you continue to inspire others. Uh, I certainly feel uh, motivated and inspired after our conversation today, and uh, I know it will benefit a lot of patients uh, in the future. And so, uh, let's say on behalf of, of everyone in the future, um, you know, thank you, and, and uh, let's keep uh, let's keep everything going. Well, thank you, Darren. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Michelle. So to our viewers and listeners, we'll see you next time.